All right. Today, we're talking about profit and purpose philosophy. So if you have a business, how do you align purpose and profit together so that they can work in harmony with one another? My guest today is Tamara Lur. I'm going to tell you more about her in a second, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I am the host of this show. And you know, every week I get to talk to interesting entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. We've had all kinds of people from Kinko's to Grubhub, Redfin, Quicken, YPO, EO, you name it. And I'd love to talk to these types of interesting entrepreneurs. Check out the archives. You can go check out all of those different uh, episodes as well. My guest here today, as I said, is Tamara Lur. She's an entrepreneur. She started her first business, which was a branding marketing agency, at the age of just 19 years old as she had graduated from university. And she creates and sells and helps other entrepreneurs create and sells uh, Ecolux beauty and wellness products online with a specialty on direct to consumer and she's also been a big advocate for net positive brands and business for good which um she also founded uh co-founded basal basal sorry basal i'm saying it wrong um which is a marketplace and community where conscious consumers can use their purchasing power to make a collective positive impact and she's also been a huge advocate for uh, female entrepreneurs in particular. And tomorrow, I know we've been working for a while to get this lined up, and I'm so excited to talk to you and, and share your journey and your story and, and where you come from. Um, I always love to know a bit more about my guests and how they were as a kid. And you said that um, when you were young, you were just like that kid who uh, crushed it in raising money for whatever cause, like school fundraiser, that sort of thing. In my area, it was like selling chocolate bars or something like that. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, young tomorrow. What what that was like for you? What you going around selling popcorn or whatever it was? Well, it's really interesting because I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was. Whereas it's such a common word in my family and household, obviously as the breadwinner and having two young girls, but and our network, obviously. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. But what I was very good at. Uh, was able to fundraise uh, for causes. So when you're at school, there's always the 40-hour famine and there's things that you're always raising for. And I just had this gift of being able to uh, put together uh, take-to-market strategies at the time, didn't know what that was, but um, being able to raise capital in a different way. So funnily enough, um, you know, I was in the Miss Australia and when everybody was, you know, baking stuff, uh, I was going and hiring out boats on a Monday night, putting on hospitality events and, you know, bringing in 10 grand for an event versus, you know, a stall. Uh, and it wasn't really until um, I was much older through university that I, I really started to see the correlation between the things that I did at school naturally and that I loved doing uh, and entrepreneurship and really knowing that for me, the two have to coexist, profit and purpose. And for me, a long time, my narrative uh, from my family and my area that I grew up in, which was a very small mining town in Australia, was that uh, people who had money uh, did it the bad way. And mm. uh, it's kind of that them and us. So as soon as I started to meet entrepreneurs and I really related to them, and I could see that they were good people and they had a mission and they had a purpose and they were solving problems, that's when I realized that that narrative was completely wrong and that the two could coexist. How how old were you when you started to have this epiphany and, and, and realized that the way you've been raised to think about entrepreneurs and, and successful business people um, was kind of holding you back in a sense? Uh, I think it was when I left home, obviously. I, I was very bored in high school. I ended up graduating at 15, so I went to university quite young. And leaving home and being in that environment around professors and, and other people who were well-travelled, who were well-educated, that was the first insight. But I think the, the biggest one was when I started out in the real world. As you know, you learn more on the job than what you do at university. And meeting some of these brands and these clients 
and looking at what they created and realizing um, that the my zone of genius, which was growing businesses inside, you know, wise and marketing and take to market strategies, uh, was something that drove their business and was something that I could actually do. The difference was is I didn't have an idea. I didn't necessarily come up with a product or or I didn't really know what it is that I wanted to create. And it was my forum, actually, that said, why would you do that? Four out of five businesses are failing. Go collaborate with one of those, which got me into sweat equity as part of what I was doing inside my digital marketing agency at the time. So um, the digital marketing agency, this is your first business that you launched. You launched it around 19 years old. Um, what, what were the early days like and what were some of the challenges for you, having, especially having come raised in a mining town and still having some of the, you know, head limitations or psychological limitations that um, you, that one has at that age? Well, what was interesting is it, it wasn't an intentional, conscious, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. It was more of a survival. That's what you do at that age, right? You're trying to survive. Yeah. And and for me, when I graduated university, got I got straight VHAs, got headhunted to an agency in the city. And I was working or told to work on all these brands that I ethically and values wise didn't agree with. Uh, McDonald's, for example, you know, selling hamburgers and sugar to kids wasn't something that aligned to my values. I had a sister who was a type one diabetic um, and I was very aware of nutrition. Um, So I didn't want to work on that client. I certainly didn't want to use my zone of genius to make their money. And I was told that that's what you do and you should be grateful that you're on these big accounts at such a young age. And it was actually a client who came to me and said, uh, look, I know you love what you're doing with us and that you're struggling with the issues with the other clients. Why don't you go out on your own? And it was a simple decision of, well, that one client could cover my whole wage for the month. So it was just that natural survival instinct of great I get to tick two boxes, which is my conscious is clear. I can work on brands that I really love, collaborate with those. And then I started building out the agency. And, you know, to me, that was a big thing. You know, I got to a million dollars in revenue, which as we know, 1% of women get to that. I was in my 20s. I thought I'd done really well until, again, you don't know what you don't know. Somebody said to me, "Your, your business is profitable, but it depends on you. So key person dependent. And it's not valued at much for an exit. It will include golden handcuffs. And the idea of going back to having a boss again really scared me because I hadn't spent much time doing that. But again, you know, just that evolution of constantly thriving and learning uh, and then realizing, okay, well, then how can I now make that next transition? And that's our job as entrepreneurs is to constantly be conscious, evolving, remaining relevant and transforming. Yeah. I often say that our greatest strength or our superpower eventually becomes our uh, limitation. Um, And it sounds like that was the case with you. You know, you are great at branding, you're great at strategy. So you start this purpose focused um, branding and marketing agency, but then it's you, it's you're the one who's providing that uniqueness. Um, And oftentimes with a more creative endeavor like branding, it can be challenging to, put an, an SOP around it or to to guide a team and say, here's how we create a brand. So how did you get yourself out of this? How did you train up your team? Well, what was interesting is around that time, I was working with some mergers and acquisition houses. So they would come to me with a business that was doing, say, 10 or 15% year on year growth. Uh, they were looking to maximize their valuation for a liquidity or an exit. And then I would basically come in and do my online piece uh, you know, explode the online revenue so then they would get a higher multiple at exit based on future projections. So I was working in collaboration and at the same time that that was happening, uh, I was also looking at how do I scale? So I'm I'm one of these people who um, have both sides of the brain. I'm creative, but I'm also extremely analytical, mm-hmm. SOP driven. I'm a huge fan of EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating Systems by Gino Wickman. 
Uh, but what I created was EGS, which is Entrepreneurial Growth Systems. EOS is great, but it doesn't address sales and marketing. So when I went through it, I went, I'm going to create systems and processes for sales, marketing, and customer service that's scalable so that anybody can do it. So that was my first thing because I knew if I could create that, I could plug that into most businesses and look at them like building blocks. Okay, this business is direct to consumer. Um, I can grab the influencer module. I can grab, you know, the SEO module. I can grab the, you know, um, three-level uh, ad for meta module and I can plug those into that business. Or if it's B2B, here's the LinkedIn model. Here's the key person of influence mod module and I can plug those in. So that was the first thing was getting the SOPs in place. The second thing was the lack of skills uh, and the cost of labor in the creative space and the retention. That was my second issue. So um, at a, I know it's only just starting in America, but 15 years ago, I was traveling to the Philippines as an EO. We went on the EO field trip and, and I started hiring and sourcing talent in the Philippines who could follow my SOPs. So that's why I get a higher multiple at exit for any business that I invest in or I mentor is because we're plugging in and we're building in-house capability when it comes to sales, marketing, and customer service. We've got much cheaper, reliable, talented, higher skilled people in the Philippines. So a full stack marketer will cost 45000 in the Philippines. You're looking at over 180 in America. All my businesses in America, by the way. So even though I've still got this silly accent. Um, so you know, those two things went straight to the bottom line. And it and it ticked the purpose as well, because we're helping these women uh, you know, by creating them their own revenue um and ability to be able to create their own wage and 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 be self-dependent, independent um in the Philippines yeah. as well. And I'm assuming so this is what kind of sequences. Okay. And I'm assuming this is what led you uh to um found uh constantina then which was ethical offshoring um talk a little bit about um how you see that uh, how you how you um ma make an offshoring process that that you define as ethical what 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 does that mean exactly well if you've ever taken a field trip to the philippines uh it's very much boys going there in business and you know not to say it's just boys but there's it, it's there's prostitution, there's bars, there's all sorts of things that are really unethical. So when I did my first field trip, um, I really hated the fact that they they looked at it as them and us. They looked at it as them as cheap labor. A lot of them take advantage of them. They make them work longer hours. Uh, they certainly don't treat them the same way as they did their onshore stuff. And for me, it's humanity. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. care where you are in the world. Uh, you show up as a kind, inclusive leader, and what's good for my onshore is good for my offshore. So we we the hybrid workforce is here to stay, but how do we treat everyone inclusively? So what's interesting is in the BPO environment in the Philippines or in Africa um, or wherever you go, they have up to a three times churn rate on their staff. So they're they're moving all the time because they don't feel valued. They know they're a commodity. They don't trust them. They're recording their screens. They're making their time stamping them. And when you go there and meet the people, they're extremely talented. They are all grown up on American um, English and to our schooling systems and universities. So And they're really trustworthy. I've never had a problem in 15 years in the Philippines compared to what I have onshore, yet we treat them like they're untrustworthy, that they're not capable, and we give them all these low-level tasks and, and treat them differently. So for me, if you... The way we treat them and the, we, we provide medical, not just for them, but for their whole family, we give them flexibility as, around their working hours so they can be there for their kids. And because of that, we're getting the top 1% of talent. So now I've got CFOs uh, with, with huge experience, you know, and, and, and um, we've got CFOs, we've got high level um, full stack marketers. We've got strategists, customer service managers. You can get that next level, whereas most people are just looking at offshoring for the low-level tasks. And to be honest, AI is probably going to wipe all that out anyway. So uh, if you treat people well, they stay longer, embed them into your culture. We we call it pods. How do we 
come in, create a pod that is a mix of on and offshore, you're working collaboratively and you're integrated as one towards a common goal. Mm. So um, it's interesting, the evolution of your different businesses, because we have digital agency, which is kind of a classic business model. We've got offshoring, which is providing labor. Um, so another classic business model. And then let's talk about uh, Basal uh, Academy um, and kind of how that evolves. Because I know you're really passionate about helping women to uh, succeed in business. And how did you figure out what the business model would be behind that? Because again, you could run into the same challenges as you did in your first business, which is how do I scale me? Exactly. Well, it's interesting because it's not just women, it's women and enlightened men. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, what happened during that, that one went again, organic. Um, I think people try too hard. Sometimes we should be listening and showing up and usually opportunities come that way as opposed to knocking down doors or trying to, you know, come up with an idea and push it on people. But during COVID, because a lot of people knew that I had this learning management system with these SOPs, and they knew that I had talent in the Philippines that uh, was in the digital marketing space and, and lead gen space. When COVID hit, all the traditional businesses, which a lot of YPO businesses, they're bigger, but they're actually uh, a lot less tech savvy. Newer businesses have to be a lot more agile, but these ones have usually been around a long time. They have market share. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them were coming to me and saying, look, I do 60 mil in retail and it's off. Like mm -hmm. I need to switch to digital now because I've got no revenue. Yeah. And, and I literally had almost 200 messages within a month of people coming saying from EO and YPO, I was going, can I have access to your IP? Can you help me? While the world is shutting down, while we're all cleaning our groceries, you have all these people that are saying, I need your time. Help! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Give me your IP. Jeez. Jeez. Uh, so uh, at the time, I obviously had a fund, a 20 more fund, and I was focused on my investments. And I thought, well, I can't use this as a distraction, but I really want to help my fellow peers. I mean, I put a lot of my success to working hard and having the right network. And um, so I rang my mentor and I said, look, this is what's going on. And uh, he said to me, you can help them. Give them access to your IP, give them access to all your SOPs and put them in a group based on what, what they're in. So B2B, they all go on a group. Direct to consumer, they all go into a group and then meet with them every week and do a forum, a special interest forum, like what we have in EO and YPO, because we all learn from experience share. They all get access to me and my business partner, Natalie. Um, I'm the visionary. She's the integrator. So it's one thing to give them the vision. They also need help with the execution. Um, a massive problem usually with mentoring. They give you the idea. They fail on the execution. So we met with them every week. We gave them access and our only fair exchange was that we would only help businesses if they were willing to stand for profit and purpose. That was my fair exchange. And that was, you know, at the start of COVID. And this year, we've got just over $6 billion of combined revenue in the current program. And all of that revenue is committed to profit and purpose in exchange for us helping them with growth advisory and with access to offshore teams and our SOPs. So when you think about the girl from <laughs> Weepa in, in Australia and to think that those businesses are now all have giving embedded, they're all, all giving back and trying to do more good than they do bad as businesses and they stand for business for good, that could be probably $10 billion next year, 20 the, the, the year after that. So that to me is that legacy part of how do we show up how do I help you with what I my zone of genius is? How do I give that to you in order for the greater good? And, you know, I think there's stages. I've been in business 25 years. So you go from survival to thriving to payback, and then you, you get into this legacy space. So for me, it's really rewarding. Um, plus, I get to learn. I get to look under the hoods of all sorts of businesses, which helps me remain relevant as well. And we've got people in the program that are from, five mil all the way up to a billion. And what's interesting is when they're in the same room, always the same 
concerns, always lead gen, predictable mm-hmm. revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, commonalities uh, that we're talking about that we all learn collectively from each other. I love how there's, you could see the kernels of what you're passionate about back when you were doing the school fundraisers and and what you do now is kind of an extension of that same original interest that you had. I'm curious, um, how do you define a company that has purpose, purpose and profit? Like uh, another way of asking this is, are there ever companies that come to you and they say, oh, we care about purpose and they want to join your community and you're like, mm, do you really? I'm not really sure. You know, how do you define like, okay, they want to give 0.0001% of all their profits to charity. Well, well that's not enough. Well, that's that's what I call arrogant um, <laughs> philanthropy. And, you know, it, I'll be blunt about it, but if you say that a percentage of profit I will give, that's basically saying as long as I'm doing extremely well, then you can do well. But that doesn't really serve people and planet because it's usually in the hard times that we need more activity around the philanthropic. So, uh, I don't believe in a percentage of profits. I believe that it should be embedded into the heart of the company. So simply put, Basal is actually an ancient Gaelic word. The name of our company is an ancient Gaelic word, and it means ethical, moral, of good intent whilst honouring the earth and its people. So Paul Polman, who um, I adore, uh, he's the ex-CEO of Unilever. He's now got Imagine and wrote the book Net Positive. He says it's doing more good than how do we do, how do we get not only to zero but go beyond that and, mm. and do more good in the world. So really just check in on yourself. Is your business doing more good? And they can both coexist. Profitable businesses I can be purpose-driven. In fact, B Corp certified companies are growing at a much faster rate and are more profitable than ones that aren't. So, you know, it's not a matter of sacrificing profits. It's about embedding it in what you do and showing up and you'll attract the best talent. As far as I'm concerned, you will be a dinosaur if you don't if you don't align to profit and purpose because it's rarely about the money. People want to get out of bed every day for a purpose. And as a leader, if you lead with that, you'll attract people like that. And they're the best types of people. That's the best culture. A related um, idea is this idea between uh, scarcity versus abundance. I know where you fall on that. But um, let's talk a little bit about that idea and and how that's important to companies um, having a greater purpose. Yeah, look, I, I think it's really, really interesting Um you have to go back and you have to start with why. So we needed to redefine the why and everybody knows Simon Sinek, but I've actually got a process in my LMS. Again, read the book. There was no system. I created what's called a compass exercise for you to be able to define what your why is in a very simple way. So you need to define your why. And then what I call it is short-term and long-term impacts. So sustainability and impact is not a destination it's a journey and we take small steps every day and there's instant things inside our learning management system that are around purpose that you can plug and play into your business and be have impact embedded from day one so it could be as simple as every time somebody leaves us a review that creates 10 impacts and I really believe that we shouldn't be picking the causes and the projects We should be leaving it up to the consumer or the client to pick that. So we're aligned with a company called Buy One, Give One. And what's great is they have over 500 certified charities that align to the United Nations Sustainability Goals. You can plug that into your business in under an hour and for less than $500 and start instantly making impacts from as little as one cent. How does that work then? Is it like the consumer is going to check out from your website, it's going to to buy something from you, or let's say you have an agency or a service business and they're about to sign the agreement, the contract, and part of it says, we're going to put a portion of the revenues into a cause, pick one, which one do you want? Is that how it works? Exactly. And Mm -hmm. you can track that on your website. If you go to our website, basalacademy.com, at the bottom, you'll see an impact section and you'll be able to see all the impacts that our clients have um, selected. And so what we do is it's, if you look at the customer value journey, which is an eight-step process, 
There's a section there which is called wow. So after we've made the initial connection, we've dated, we've decided, yes, we're going to we're going to give this a go um, and they're going to engage your services, you might send a bill for $1,000 and that might be 10 impacts that it creates. And then we invite them to select causes that are dearest to their heart. So, you know, for some people, if they know someone who has someone uh, who's got breast, breast cancer, they can give to that. If they're really animal lovers, they can save an orangutan. They can do all whatever resonates with them. The most important thing is, is we say to people, why don't you do this exercise with your family? Because it's a great thing to sit down and with your kids, you all have one impact or two impacts each. This is just showing up and saying it's a very inexpensive exercise to do, but we can measure our impact. And then separately to that, we have community. So we offer all our team uh, time once they've met the KPIs. We don't time track. We're all about performance and outcomes. Once they've met their KPIs, then we say to them, you can use office hours or work hours to go and do something that's important to you to volunteer time. So that's mm-hmm. another thing that we do. Um, and then the other thing is a relief fund. So because we most of our uh, team is in the Philippines, we have a relief fund and we set aside funds every single month on behalf of our team. Uh, so we we do $50 a month per team member. That goes into a relief fund so that whenever there's a natural disaster, a death in the family, whatever is going on in their life, we don't want them to feel helpless. There's a fund available. They can tap into that and we don't govern it. It's mm. governed by our management team who decide how to allocate those funds. So think of ways that you can show up for your people, for your clients and planet, and you you will quickly start seeing that little things can create amazing impact. Now, they're short-term. Long-term is more like we're, we're mentoring a company that sells suits. They've got 40 stores, and, and I'm talking to them about how do we more, be more sustainable in our manufacturing processes. Now, that's going to take time. That's about solar on the manufacturing plants, clean water, sustainable fabrics, zero fashion. Those sorts of things take longer to implement. So that's part of that journey, but we can start now by showing up and doing small things each day. I love that. That's that's so cool. Um, I want to. We're running a little short on time. I want to ask about a couple of, of additional things before we wrap up. Um, you attended and graduated from the entrepreneurial master's program at MIT in Boston when you were a member of Yo. I did my first year this year. It was an amazing program. Um, I'd love to know Great. kind of the impact that that program had on you and and any other you know programs that you've had where you put yourself into a situation where you're surrounded by, you know, a high level of peers that, um, that kind of help you to elevate your game. Always be the little fish. In fact, I like to be the guppy. So I, <laughs> I'm always evolving. And that should trying. be a t-shirt. Always be the guppy. I like that. <laughs> I'm the guppy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I love when, when, you know, when you constantly have a, well, EO, as you know, thirst for learning, that's so important and remaining relevant. So I just, they inspire me. These people don't intimidate me. They inspire me. I, I'm like that annoying child who, you know, asks a million questions because I learn so much through the network and peer learning. So, yeah, I mean, EMP was tremendous. I I, I learned so much, met some lifelong friends there. And of course, got my mentor, Jeff Hoffman. He was one of the speakers and I was I was um, blessed enough for him to mentor me. And, uh, you know, now that I'm in YPO, I'm in Titans, which is even more intimidating. Again, the people that we were learning about in EMP, like Vern Harnish and, and uh, Mark Moses and all those people are in Titans. So now I'm again a little guppy. There, there's not many women. All but two. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone again, but that's what I love. Uh, I want to learn from these people. I really do believe that in, at that level, there's so much abundance. There's so much giving. There's so much shared knowledge. And more importantly, they all do believe in business as a force for good. They're at that legacy part, which I really love. So wherever you are in your journey, find people that are just at that next step Go learn from them, hang around them, grow into that space. And like rings of a tree, when you start filling that space, you draw another ring, make it 30% bigger outside of your comfort zone, step into it as a guppy, fill that space. So when people say, you know, look at you, 
you know, where you're at now, I always say, hang on, I've been drawing circles for 25 years. Just mm-hmm. keep keep drawing circles and keep tapping into mentorship and peer learning. That's great. Um, two more questions. Uh, you put out a book, Balance is BS, How to Have a Work-Life Blend. What do you mean by that? Well, balance doesn't work. If you think about it fundamentally, it means that you've got family and business here. And if you spend too much time on business, you have to go, oh, okay, take that, put it over to family. So you're constantly playing this juggling game. And the issue with that is there's no self, which is the most important thing. So you would know from EO, self, business, family of the three important things. So I didn't want to compromise. When I had children, I didn't want to say, okay, now I've got to put business on the back burner and focus more on family. Instead, I make sure that I know what to say no to. It's more important what you say no to than yes. So unless it's a hell yes, I don't do it. And I blend everything. So when I was president of EO, I was one of the first that said, let's bring children to our chapter retreat because I didn't want to go away without my kids. And I blend friendships. My business partner is my best friend. So I have no problem with that because as long as you are in check with your values and you're showing up authentically, there's no reason to separate the two. So I pick people that are values aligned and then we figure out how to work together long-term. And because of that, it never feels like work. I'm always having fun. I'm always um, inspired by the beautiful people around me. And we always have kids in the background coming with us on planes. Last time I went, it was school holidays. And my daughter said, oh, are you coming away on the school holidays? And I said, I am. Do you want to do Disneyland? Let's do that. So we just blended it and they came along for the trip. So that's sort of what I believe is the model. So we don't, especially for women, we don't compromise and we don't have guilt. I I just don't want to play that game. Um, all right. I lied. I have one additional question that I'm going to add based on that answer that you gave just there. You mentioned you have two daughters. I have one daughter. She's four and a half Maya. Um, what should we be doing to raise our daughters in this world, especially if we want them to explore whether entrepreneurship is right for them? Well, we're simply guides. We're good to make them safe and to guide them. We're not here to be their best friend. We need to move into that elder role and and really let them become who they're meant to be. Everyone's born with seed potentiality. Everyone's born with a purpose for why they're here on this planet. Our job is to make sure that they can step into that and not become an adult. There's so much adulthood stuff that makes it, it squashes dreams. They don't think is big. My job is to show them what's possible and to to give them exposure without freaking them out around worldly issues, around things that are important, and show them that there's an opportunity for us to collectively come together and fix this. It's We can't rely on the one Steve Jobs or the one Bill Gates or the one we, we need as a business community. We do $9 trillion in YPO alone. If we were all committed to solving the world's problems, we could fix this. So by showing them and guiding them, that's my role, and then they will take their own path. I believe it's already set. Mm. Uh, but, you know, my my daughters, it was so funny that at a young age they thought that every father was stay-at-home dad and that every mother worked. And they thought that giving was embedded in everything. And when I said, no, this, this could be made in China, these shoes, by children who don't get mm. to go to school, you know, like little things Their perception on the world is different because of the people that they're hanging around. So, again, that's the importance of blending. Bring them to these events. You know, I don't say sorry for being late or having background noise. I ask for permission. I say, I have two daughters and you're an amazing role model. Could we blend on the boat this weekend and bring our kids? Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, I think the majority of our team is actually moms. And uh, so, and we had a a team meeting this morning where um, one of our team members, her um, son was in the background and it was, I put a huge smile on my face. I just love seeing kids in the Zoom windows, you know, it's like uh, so great. And it makes me proud. As they get older, they're listening. Yeah. They are listening. Natalie's my business partner. Her daughter is older. She's 19. And what was interesting is she studied, she decided to do business. And she comes home and says, I'm smarter than the teacher. Like I I know more about business than the out-of-touch teacher, the Mm -hmm. lecturer. And it's because 
she, every time she's going to school, she's hearing our conversations, our deals, our decision making, all of those sorts of things, uh, which I think is great for them to be exposed to. Yeah. All right. Last question. My gratitude question. I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude, especially to those who've helped you along the way, especially peers and contemporaries. So, you know, a lot of times people mention their family, which is fine, or they mention their team, which is fine. But I especially love to hear, um, you know, acknowledgement of peers, contemporaries, mentors who helped us through the rough times and who we just want to, you know, acknowledge for being there for us. Look, I think um, when when you get targeted and as you get bigger, there's things that do happen. You decide that you want to retreat, uh, especially as a woman you do. And in those times where I went, look, I've got enough to retire. I think that's enough. Uh, and, you know, I I stand by my values and sometimes that those values come up against people who are, you know, the vulture capitalists of the world because there are old school thinking and there are people that are still doing business with brown paper bags. And the bigger you get, the more you see of that. So I thought maybe I don't want to be a big, big business. Maybe this isn't my environment um, that I want to be in. And every time that has happened and I've decided or thought about quitting, it has been an enlightened man or a mentor who has said, I'm not going to let you. And they have been at me every day until I showed up again. Uh, because basically they said, get over yourself. You're here for a purpose. No one wants to hear about these things from a middle-aged white man. I'm sorry it's you. Get out there, share the message, show them that it can be done differently, and we have your back when these things happen, when people decide that they don't want to be transparent, when they decide that they don't want to do the right thing by their employees and you're a natural target. They've always had my back. And now I've got a business partner, Natalie, who's my best friend, and she always has my back. And if you don't have those champions in the background, you could easily quit. And I probably would have three or four mm. times by now. So, mm. you know, whenever you see anyone who's successful, um, besides, you know, Grant Cadone, who only talks in I, anybody who's done really, really well in life uh, never says I. They always say mm. we. And, you know, there's, the, as, as my husband says, he says, I'm the first lady. He makes sure everything's done and he's my biggest champion so that mm -hmm. I can go and step into my zone of genius and the purpose for why I was put on this planet. So I, figure I, out I, who those people are. Find I know it's people. not easy and I want to thank you for what you do. And I can't wait until my daughter Maya can join your community when she's older, if she wants to do it, if, if she's into it. Um, well, I, I want to, uh, I want to thank you for your time here tomorrow. Where can people go to um, connect with you and learn more about what you do? Look, I've got heaps of resources on my website uh, for anything. Uh, what's mine is yours. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I offer a one hour to any person who is looking to become more profit and purpose driven. Uh, that is my give back. I do three of those a week. So reach out. Uh, there's nothing worse than sitting there and listening and going, she probably won't take a call. Please reach out. You'd be surprised. Busy people have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.